Aren't we blessed to have this group of young people who share with us and so often in music? Let's give them our thanks. Some uh, people who have loved Jesus a lot in the past have shown their love by writing poetry and music and sort of this devotional life that inspires all of us. Others have shown their love for Jesus by serving others and giving to them in very self-sacrificial ways. The woman who wrote our first hymn did both. She was the wife of the Anglican Chief Bishop of Ireland. Her name was Cecil Humphreys, and she later married Reverend William Alexander. And she showed her concern by disadvantaged people by spending hours every day visiting the poor and providing food and warm clothes and medicine to them. She even founded a school for the deaf. But she also wrote many hymns that have become greatly loved by us to express her devotion to Jesus and help us to express ours. And one of those hymns she wrote was Jesus Calls Us or the Tumult. Let's stand as we sing it together. God, you have brought us to this place from this crazy and chaotic world to restore us for another week. Help us worship you with our whole hearts, minds, and bodies as we set aside all things to be together with you and one another as your church. We offer ourselves to you as a sacrifice as you offered yourself for us. We pray this in your mighty name, Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now let's greet one another with a wave and smiling eyes. Kids, this part of the service is for you as we pay attention to the Barclay family and see what they have to share with us this morning. Jesus is talking to some people and he says, 
that sometimes in heaven, first will be last and last will be first. You know what that means, guys? He also, right before that, is talking about how hard it is for a rich person to get into heaven. So what Jesus is trying to tell people is that how you live on earth, whether you got money, whether you're powerful, whether you're important, Jesus and God don't really care about that. He's looking out for everybody. And he's saying that sometimes you may feel like you're last on earth, but when you get to heaven, you're first in my eyes. Just like how Rachel was last, but she's really first in my eyes. God says the same thing. And I want y'all to remember that. Don't feel like, you know what, I'm not as good as somebody, or I can't do that, or I don't have that car that they have, or I can't do that thing, or they have a bigger house. You know what? God doesn't care about any of that stuff, guys. He says in his eyes, he loves everybody. First will be last, last will be first. Can y'all remember that? All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for these wonderful children, and thank you for Corinth, and thank you that you don't see us the way we see each other here on earth. You don't care what we have. You don't care where we come from. You don't care what color our skin is. You don't care about any of that. You believe that the first will be last, the last will be first, because you love us all the same. And when we get to heaven, we're all going to be the same under your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. Way back. Thanks, Corinth. I know some of that was a little bit difficult to hear, but the bottom line was the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. Jesus says that in our scripture reading today. Thanks, Barclay family and Hardy family, for our children's message today. So, uh, pay attention. I've got more things to share with you than I usually do. So put on your listening ears for just a moment. And first of all, some pandemic news. This afternoon at 2 o'clock, Pastor Bob and Linda go to get our second vaccine, and we're really excited about that. So that means in two weeks, I don't have to, like, you know, slip in the back at the last minute and, you know, sneak out the back as soon as we're over. I'm going to get out there and greet people, but I'm still going to wear my mask. So I want to explain a little bit about the thinking behind masks, even when you have a vaccine. For those of you who are increasingly coming in person. I realize that when you're vaccinated, you are uh, safer and other people are safer around you. That's the whole point, right? What we don't know, and I can't fix everything out in this society or community or business or whatever, what we don't know when we come to church is everybody who has also been vaccinated. So I want you to imagine somebody goes like, I, I wanna go visit that church. I need Jesus, I've felt distanced. And they come in and they haven't been vaccinated and they aren't safe or they don't feel safe that's the person that I'm thinking about when I say I'm going to still wear my mask after I'm vaccinated. So somebody might walk into church and go like, oh, no, people aren't wearing masks. Or they're not going to ask you, are you, have you been vaccinated before I sit near you? So to make it less awkward and make it more possible for more people to continue to worship, at least for the near future, we're going to ask you to continue wearing masks when you come on Sunday morning. All right, having said that, you will notice today that we've opened up a lot more seats uh, than we have been in the past, and that's intentional. We're moving forward as uh, safely and um, properly, I think, as we can. If you're online, of course, that didn't apply to you as much, but I just want to remind you that your bulletin is available for you at corinthtoday.org slash now. And you'll also find the kids' activity sheet there as well. So here's something for particularly uh, those of you who love kids, which I hope is most of you. Uh, last Sunday, we announced that we'd love to have prayer partners for our children. And many of our children were adopted to have someone who would pray for them, but not every child. So we have about 25 more kids that we'd love to have somebody just say, I will pray regularly for that child. And Sharon Rao actually is in our worship service. Raise your hand, Sharon. She knows who they are. So either get in touch with Sharon after the service or sometime this week and say, I'd love to adopt one of those kids and pray for them. We'd like every child to have a prayer partner. We have been focusing on more ways to reconnect with the campus, even if we can't have mass gatherings. And so let me mention a few of those. First of all, some thank yous. Thank you to everyone who donated blood this past week. We had 56 pints donated on Thursday, which exceeded our goal. Thank you for everyone who came. There were 33 who came yesterday for work day, and they made a big difference on our grounds. You probably noticed that as you drove in today. Next up, uh, students who are in grades 6 through 12 are going to have pizza following the worship service and then go together for a mission opportunity at Valley Haven Camp this afternoon. 
Also, all through the week, there are different hours when the sanctuary is open for private prayer. Those hours are listed in your bulletin. And uh, starting later this week, we're also going to have a visual art display over in the Mitchell House. This means that Corinth members who have uh, done sculpture or painting or photograph would like to share some of their work as part of your Lenten discipline. You can spend some time over there and meditate on some of these works, which are works of uh, biblical story, and others are simply God's beautiful world. So watch your bulletin, watch your newsletter this week for the details on the art display. Midweek and um, other uh, Wednesday night, small groups are increasingly gathering. If you want to know more, please let us know about that. Wednesday night dinners are by sign-up only, and you can pick it up through the drive through That sign-up is on your bulletin also. Next week, we're going to have coffee and donuts, but you have to come early because it's going to be before the 11 o'clock service. So come on and join an outside time of fellowship next Sunday, weather permitting. One final announcement, if you are a member of Corinth Reformed Church and you have not received either in your mailbox or by email a notice about our upcoming annual meeting, if you haven't received that, it means that we don't have your correct contact information. And that would be a sad thing from our perspective. So let the church office know this week if you haven't gotten that notice and we will make sure we get your information correct. Some of you may be wondering why we began the service with uh, our string players playing Sunrise, Sunset. And those of you who are particularly astute know where that piece of music comes from. It comes from Fiddler on the Roof, and so will our offertory today. And I think when you hear the offertory and then you hear the sermon, you'll see why Fiddler on the Roof connects to today's worship service. So with that in mind, I'll turn it over to Pastor Lori. Our greatest offering is ourselves. God gives us gifts and talents and to share in many different ways. You have a variety of choices throughout the week to share, and this morning you have an opportunity to share in our worship financially as you have done generously throughout this year. We have been a beacon of hope in our community and throughout the world. Another way that we share our gifts is through our talents. These young people here, Chris Sepulveda shares this morning. All right, <laughs> correct me. Sepulveda. Sepulveda will share in our gifts this morning. I've always massacred his name. My apologies. What a great joy it is to be able to um, share in all of these. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, we do offer ourselves, our talents, our finances, those ways that we can give to you. We do so humbly. May you bless them. May you bless those that receive them to your glory and your honor. May they be pleasing to you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. If I were a rich man, all day long I'd be de 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 bum. If I were a wealthy man, wouldn't have to work hard. If I were a pretty pretty rich, diga diga da 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 a tall house with rooms by the dozen right in the middle of the town and a fine tin roof with green wooden floors below 
There would be one long staircase just going up And one even longer coming down And one more leading nowhere just for show I'd fill my yard with chicks and turkeys and geese and ducks for the town to see and hear. Squawking just as noisily as they can. With each loud quack and cluck and gobble and honk, led like a trumpet to the ear, as if to say a rich man living here. If I were a rich man, diddle daddle daddle diddle daddle dagga dagga dum. All day long I'd biddy biddy bum. If I were a wealthy man, wouldn't have to work hard. Diddle daddle diddle daddle daddle dagga dagga dum. If I were a biddy biddy bitch, digga digga daddle daddle dum. I see my wife, my Goldie, looking like a rich man's wife with a proper double chin. Supervising means to her heart's delight. I see her putting on airs and strutting like a peacock. Oh, what a happy mood she's in. Screaming at the servants day and night. The most important man in town will come to fawn on me. They will ask me to advise them. Like a solemn and the wise. If you please, Reptavia, pardon me, Reptavia, posing problems that would cross the rabbi's eye. Boy, 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 And it won't make one bit of difference if I answer right or wrong. When you're rich, they think you really know. If I were rich, I'd have the time that I lack to sit in the synagogue and pray, and maybe have a seat by the eastern wall, and i discuss the holy books with the learned men seven hours every day. This would be the sweetest thing of All day long I'd bitty bitty bum If I were a wealthy man Wouldn't have to work hard Lord who made the lion and the lamb You decree I should be what I am Would it spoil some vast eternal plan? If I were a wealthy
You may be seated. Holy God, may we hear clearly this morning. May we see without fog, may our hearts be opened, and may you anoint our pastor's lips, that your word is proclaimed through scripture and spoken. In the mighty Redeemer's name, Jesus, amen. We continue in Matthew 19, beginning with verse 16. Just then, a man came to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he inquired. Jesus replied, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man replied. What shall I lack? Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Peter asked, answered him, We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you have, who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So what would you do if you were a rich man? Uh, many of us who grew up in circumstances very different than the ones in which we live now remember asking questions like that. What would I do if I actually had money? My family were missionaries uh, to Pakistan, and I remember, you know, we, we'd always travel fourth class on the ocean liner. People didn't fly in those days, you know, around the world. And so we'd always travel fourth class. And those rich people, they got to, you know, be in first class and have all the great food. And we, uh, I don't know what we had, probably hot dogs or something uh, down in the belly of the ship. But did you ever dream about that? So apparently some kid in Iceland maybe might come from a wealthier family because he had enough money to build the Titanic out of Legos. Uh, that's pretty impressive uh, to have that many Legos and accomplish something like that, right? So what, what did you dream about? It's very hard, even if you have all the Legos, to build the Titanic. I can't imagine how long it took this 11-year-old to do that project. In the same way, Jesus says it is very hard if you are a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Let me rephrase that a little bit. 
It is very hard for most of us who are in this room to enter the kingdom of God. Very hard. It is very hard for people who have enough food to eat, who don't have to wonder, like, I wonder where I'm going to get groceries this week or we'll starve. Or for people who can afford to go out to eat, even if it's McDonald's, when they want to, much less anywhere else. Or for people who drive a comfortable car. That was one of the things that Linda and I, you know, remember when we were newly married and for about the first decade of our marriage, we drove hand-me-down cars, basically. Somebody would feel sorry for us and give us a car. In our first church, somebody had given us, I think it was uh, uh, a Lincoln, I'm, I'm not sure, but it was like, it had 160,000 miles on it, light blue, the paint was coming off, the felt was drooping down inside the car, and we were still driving that car in 1992 when Corinth was interviewing us to be a pastor of this church. And I've never asked Joe Rao or the other members of the search committee whether this is true or not, but I'm fairly sure the search committee must have said, if we call that guy as pastor, he is not leading our funeral processions with a car like that. So they put in the contract, we're going to provide you a vehicle when you come here. So, you know, it's like a really big deal to actually drive a new car. And most of you, not all of you, but most of you listening to my voice know what it's like to drive a car that you don't have to worry about whether it's going to get you to point A or point B. Most of us live in homes that are comfortable. Most of us have the luxury of saving something, even a little bit, if not a lot, for a rainy day or for the future. Most of us have the luxury of giving to say, I have more than I really need. I'd like to help out others. If you fit any of those categories, much less all of them, then Jesus says it is very hard for you to enter the kingdom of heaven. So first of all, let's be honest about who's the rich man. We all are. Compared to most of the world, most of the time, we are all wealthy. And Jesus then goes on to say it's not only difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, it is downright impossible. It is downright impossible to get money right. And if any of us is thinking, you know, I'm quite sure that the Holy Trinity has conversations among them saying, we're looking down upon the earth and Pastor Bob of all the people in the world, has a perfect balance and honors me with everything he does with his money. Does anybody think that Jesus is saying that about you? So it is actually, in my view, impossible to do money absolutely right from a Christian perspective. So let me give you a couple reasons why. One of the reasons Tim Keller points out in his book, Counterfeit Gods, he said money is different than other sins. There are some sins where you don't have any question at all whether you're doing the right thing. So he says in the middle of an act of adultery, nobody goes like, I I wonder if I should maybe stop now. This might not be moral or right. Adultery is something like you're either doing it or you're not, right? You're either in bed with somebody or you're not. There's not a gray area in the middle there. Money's not like that. Money has a series of sliding scales. And how do I know where I am on the sliding scale? How much money is it okay to own? How much giving makes God say, okay, that's enough? Like if I give a tithe, is God going, bingo, you got it. Happy with that? Or the more I have, does he really want more than that? How much money is it okay to spend on a home? or a car, or if I go out to eat at McDonald's, is God okay with that? But if I go to, you know, Boca, God's going like, no, you're spending too much money on yourself. Like, how do I really know? There are all these sliding scales, and there are lots of them related to money. So that's where I say, like, it's really not possible to know for sure that I get money exactly right. And that leads me, and I hope you, into an honest question about Matthew chapter 19. 
what exactly is Jesus saying? So I hope I've got your attention, and you can look with me at this passage and what happens. So it's rather straightforward, but let's kind of walk through it briefly. You may know more about this story from the parallel accounts in Mark and Luke, but I'm just going to stick to what Matthew tells us in his gospel. And he begins, just then a man came up to Jesus. Now, if you know, for example, he's rich or young, you don't know that yet. All you know is a male has come up to Jesus. And the just then is a connection to the story before this, which is when Jesus had surrounded himself with little children, and he said, let the little children come to me, for the kingdom of heaven is made up of these. It belongs to such as these. So this man, right at that moment, with all the children around, comes up to Jesus, and he asks a question. And he says, teacher... Now, that's a, that's a term of respect, right? So he either, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's assume he's sincere. He is honoring Jesus as a well-respected rabbi, and he is saying, Jesus, what do I need to do? What good thing do I need to do to inherit eternal life? So he has come to love life on this earth the way it is played out for him, but he doesn't want it to end, and he feels like something is missing in his world, and he wants to make sure that when he takes his last breath on earth, there's something that follows after that. What good thing do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And in verse 17, Jesus answers his question with a question. He says, why are you asking me about what is good? Only God is good. So let's be careful how we use the word good. Good is not comparison like good, better, or best. Good is absolute perfection. So let's think about this. Only God is absolutely perfect. And then Jesus engages the man not to toy with him, but to point out the fallacy of his question itself. So it may be sincere, but let's talk about what's behind your question. If you want to enter life, Jesus says, keep the commandments. The man certainly understood. That's what he had heard a lot about. And so he says, okay, which ones? That may be a strange question to you. We know about the Big Ten, right? Um, But there weren't just the Big Ten that people in the Old Testament knew about. The rabbis had actually made a list of 613 commands in the Torah and had prioritized them. So essentially what what the man is saying is, look, we know you can't keep all 613. Nobody can do that. Aren't some of them more important than others, Jesus? So which ones are most important? And Jesus replies with five out of the big ten. And it's strategic which five he chooses, right? They're all very observable, outward, at least in popular uh, popular understanding. They are things you know whether you did or not. But Jesus starts with that list. Let's start with these, okay? Don't murder. Don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't lie under oath, and honor your father and mother. Now, that when he flips to the end, maybe for reasons have to do with a man's misunderstanding, but let's just go with it, okay? And then he adds one that when the rabbis listed the 613, number two was love your neighbor as yourself. So all of these have to do with your relationship with, the, with other people, and Jesus says, let's start there. Have you kept these commandments? And the man says... In verse 20, all these I have kept. Now, this is the first time we learned that he's young. So now we know he's a man, but he's also young. That might put a little bit of a different twist on this. He's got a lot of life in front of him, and he says, I've kept all of these. What do I still lack? In other words, there's still something eating at me. I'm not sure I'm quite there yet. And Jesus answers, if you want to be perfect, if you want to get from here where you feel you are, all the way to know for sure that you have eternal life. This is what I want you to do. I want you to go, sell all of your possessions, and give it to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. So what's Jesus doing? He's saying, you keep, or you think you keep, the ones that are observable and evident and concrete. But what I deliberately didn't say to you the first time is there are some other commands here that say things like love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength and don't make for yourself any idol. So let's talk about this part. Are you willing to do this? So if you want to be perfect, if you really want to reach the goal you're after, complete the obedience, let's get to your heart. And I know that what's at the center of your heart is your money. 
So then we learn in verse 22 that he's not only young and male, but he's wealthy. So this gives him in his culture three advantages that not everybody had. So one wonders, would the conversation have played out differently, or would the example have been different if he were old and male and rich? Would he have even asked the question? Or if he were young and female and rich? Or if he were young and male and poor? So all of this plays into how this story plays out, right? He's got a lot of privilege in his culture by being young and male and rich. As one commentator said, he has a great cake. What he wants is some icing on top of the cake. Can I have my cake and still have eternal life? I want something more than what I've experienced now. So then the man walks away and he's sad. He's dejected because he's not willing to do that. And when, with him out of earshot, Jesus turns to his disciples. And he says, I tell you the truth, or we would say, I swear, it's so hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's harder than squeezing a camel, camel through a needle's eye. Now, forget what you heard about the gate in the wall of Jerusalem that was called the needle's eye or the needle's gate. That's a medieval legend. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's not saying it's really difficult for a camel to get down on its knees and go through the needle's eye gate, right? That's not what he's talking about. He's saying it's impossible, right? A camel can't do that. It is impossible for the camel to go through an eye of a needle. And when the disciples heard this, verse 25, they were astonished and asked, well, who then can be saved? They're operating under the assumption that people then and now and before them and after us will make. And that is, if you have money, you must be blessed by God. I must be doing the right thing. God is smiling on me because I have money. And the disciples, even though they've been with Jesus for a while and they've heard his teaching, are still operating under that assumption. How in the world can anybody be saved if he can't be saved? And Jesus looks at them. I love this. He, he looks at them. He connects with them eye to eye and face to face. And he says, with human beings, that's impossible. But don't ever use the word impossible with God. God can rescue, he can save even someone who is wealthy. Now, Peter in verse 27, the text takes an interesting twist here because Peter says, well, we've left everything. Jesus, which is true, right? I mean, they abandoned everything and everyone to follow Jesus. Well, how cool is that, Jesus? We left everything. What's going to be in it for us? Now, you would think at that point, or at least I would, that Jesus would say, you're just like him, like you're just thinking about you, right? What, a, what kind of question is that? What's in it for us? Jesus doesn't do that at all. Jesus actually answers his question. And he says, truly, I tell you, at the renewal of all things. So he's thinking now the end game. When the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you have followed me, will sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. You say, what does that mean? I'm going to give you the honest Pastor Bob answer. I don't know. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake, in other words, your stuff and your people, will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. So let me just summarize how the Bible talks about the afterlife. Because we would love to know specifics about what heaven is going to be like, and the Bible really doesn't do that for us. It does it in two ways. Um, it talks about heaven in terms of what will not be there. So one of the things we learn from this is you will not be disappointed in heaven. You're not going to get there and go, shucks, I thought it was going to be better than this. Okay, so there's no disappointment when you get to heaven. That's number one thing that Jesus is saying. And number two, Jesus is saying that nothing you have sacrificed... Oh, let me, let me rephrase that. Number two is Jesus is saying heaven is like something. This is typical of the New Testament. It's like streets of gold, right? It's like a big banquet. So in this case, he's saying it's like sitting on a throne. It's like having a hundred times more of all of the things that you thought were valuable in the world. 
right? So that's how, that's the only way, like heaven is indescribable for us, but, but we can tell you what's not there, no death or pain or mourning, no disappointment. And we can tell you that it's like all the things that you think you long for in this world, including family and stuff, it's like that only a hundred, a thousand, a million times better. So that's really all that Jesus is saying. Yes, to those of you who have sacrificed whatever you've sacrificed for my sake, you will not be disappointed and it will be worth it when you get there. You'll have so much more than you could possibly even imagine. And then he summarizes the whole thing with a one-liner that could be the conclusion to this story or a setup for the next. Many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. So the parable that follows this is a parable about a slew of workers who showed up for work at the beginning of the day and were promised a fair wage. So just for theoretical purposes, 15 bucks an hour, okay? So they're promised that for a full day's work. And they're going like, great, that's awesome. I have a job today. They went to work. And they were happy with that and would have been happy with that at the end of the day, except that people that were hired at 9 o'clock and noon and uh, an hour before quitting time got the same thing. And then they became very discontent. And Jesus says, many who are last will be first, and those who are first will be last. In other words, God will never disappoint. He will never, um, he will never give you less than what will make heaven worth it, but he may give others more than you think they deserve. Okay? So that's the passage, right? This is the whole story. So now we have to figure out what to do with it. So if the story of the rich man, this young rich man, were the only story where Jesus ever dealt with money, or if every time he talked to someone who had money, he said the same thing, go sell everything that you have and give it to the poor, then we would say that is the Christian standard for what it looks like to handle your money correctly. You're supposed to sell everything and give it to the poor. But the truth is that Jesus met a lot of other wealthy people. Nicodemus comes to mind. Zacchaeus comes to mind. And Joseph of Arimathea comes to mind. And as far as we know, he never said to another wealthy man, only this one person to whom did he say, uh, I want you to sell everything and give it to the poor. The Jewish teaching actually in that day was it's not wise to give away all of your possessions because then you're going to be dependent on someone else. You do have a responsibility to care for yourself. So Jesus is obviously dealing with something in this man's heart that is unusual, but that doesn't let the rest of us off the hook. We still have to ask, okay, what is Jesus saying to us? What does he say to others if he doesn't say to sell everything and give it to the poor? So Jesus gives us a connection in this passage that I think is the key to understanding it. Because when he turns around and talks to the disciples, he talks about homes and fields, but he also says if you've left siblings or parents... Most people go like, that's a no-brainer, happy to leave my family of origin behind. And then he says, or if you've left wife and children for my sake, I will reward you. When we look consistently at the teachings of Jesus, he never says it's okay to abandon your responsibility or your commitment to your family. So clearly Jesus is not teaching about family, leave them behind, right? Doesn't matter what happens to them, come follow me. Part of following Jesus is honoring your parents and honoring the commitments that you make. So what Jesus is saying here is if you've lost any of that, if they abandon you, or if you've lost what was precious to you in the world, I promise you, you will not be disappointed in the age to come. And so if we extrapolate that back into what Jesus is saying about money, he's saying whether it's children or money or things or fields, if you lose anything, whatever you give up for me, I promise you, you will not be disappointed. So that's the principle. So what else does Jesus say about money? I want to go to another passage because this one um, leads me in that direction. A passage where Jesus says, Luke 12, verse 15, watch out. This is a message for all of us, particularly all of us who are rich in comparison to the rest of the world. Watch out, he says. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. That's not just written to wealthy people. That's written to everyone. All right? So I've been asking this week, both in my reading and my study and in conversations in Bible study groups, 
What does it actually look like to have a godly, Jesus-driven perspective on our possessions? That question is for all of us. So let me just throw a few ideas out for you. What does it look like for you? What are you watching out for? Number one, you watch out for comparison. Am I constantly evaluating my own success or image versus those who have more or those who have less? If I'm constantly comparing, I probably need to be watching out for greed. Second, complaining. Whether it's to God or to my family or to my employer, am I deeply discontent with where I am in life right now? Another checkpoint, a checklist. So this is the problem with the rich young man, right? He had a checklist. I don't murder. I don't steal. I don't commit adultery. Is that good enough? If I have a checklist of things that I do, right? This is where I do give my money. This is how I do honor God's commands. Then I may be ignoring deeper issues in my relationship to money. So don't have a checklist and think that God's okay with everything because I do a few things well. What about obsession? That's something to watch for. Does tracking my wealth occupy so much time and attention that I can't focus on anything or anyone else? And then treasure. So this is a powerful one, and Jesus does talk about this. Would my life be meaningless if I lost all my stuff? Would I be one of those, if the stock market crashed, that would go into deep depression and maybe even take my life because my identity was so tied up with what I have? And again, there's an even deeper parallel here for most of us. What if I lost my family? You know, Job had to answer both of those questions. If God takes away all of my children and all of my stuff, is God enough for me? Where's my treasure? That's what to watch for. And then my thoughts. When I don't have to think about the task in front of me or the people in front of me or a conversation that's ongoing, does my mind consistently go back to the default of my possessions? And then priorities. If someone who were objective were looking at my checkbook, looking at my calendar, would they say this person clearly has a priority on the things of God? And then secrets. Does my spouse, or if not married, someone close to me know everything about all of my assets and all of my debts and obligations? If not, I have secrets. And the secrets themselves may say, this thing is most important to me. And then obsession. What I mean by that is, am I so tied to the things of this earth that heaven's not particularly appealing. But I'm going like, I don't want to die. I'm enjoying life too much. I, I, I'm okay with just the cake, not even longing for the icing. And then exchange. When I do give something, do I expect something back from someone to whom I give? Condescension. Do I assume that those who struggle financially are getting what they deserve because they're not as godly as I am or not as honest as I am? That I am where I am because I deserve it and others are where they are because they don't. And then indifference. Am I cold-hearted to those who have less than I do? In his book, Counterfeit uh, Gods, Tim Keller tells the story of Andrew Carnegie whose legacy is that of a philanthropist. And the reason that's his legacy is because at age 33, Carnegie said these words, no idol is more abasing than the worship of money. I'm not going to worship money, he said. And so he set out to give money away, and particularly to give money away to build 2,059 libraries for the public and for his employees. What you may not know about Andrew Carnegie is that as a steel magnet, he employed you know, thousands of people uh, that, um, that made his money for him. And one of the steel workers was to say later in Carnegie's life, we didn't want him to build a library for us. We wanted a decent wage. His employees would work 12-hour shifts in intolerably hot 
steel mills for 12 days straight, and on the 13th day would work a 24-hour shift so that they could have one day off every two weeks. That made him a lot of money. But the people who worked for him would say, we'd rather have a decent house to live in. We'd rather not die in our 40s. But here was a man who was known for giving away and yet cold to those that were right within his realm of responsibility. So if there's indifference to those who are without, it may mean that money has become my God. So you say, Pastor Bob, what a list. I hate leaving church so guilty. Good! All right. So you tell me the standard that I've held up is really hard, and I'm going to say, mission accomplished. It's not hard. It's impossible. It's like an elephant walking a tightrope. Nobody does this right. And it is true that not only this, but everything Jesus does is a setup for the gospel of grace. It's a setup for the communion table where we will gather in a moment. It's a setup to say, look, there's a standard here, and anybody who thinks I'm almost at the standard, and if I do one more good thing, I'm going to get to heaven, is missing the boat. So this is all a setup for the fact that Jesus will die and rise again so that we might have forgiveness and grace. But that doesn't let us off the hook. Because as people who have more than most people, the way we respond to this grace of God to people such as we who don't get it right is out of gratitude for all God has given to us. That the rich in heaven became poor so that we through his poverty might become rich. The response is to say, Lord, how can I best use what you've given me in ways that will honor you? What's the next step? It really helps me when I get to this point to borrow from the words of others in prayer because honestly, I hardly know what to say when I think about this topic. What am I supposed to do with this? How do I even pray? In our narthex there, we have a book called Every Moment Holy, and it's there for loan or uh, if you want a copy, you can take it with you. So go to that next slide. Um, did you already show that? Yeah, that, that one there. So this is the book, and there's a prayer in that book that's a prayer for the impulse to buy. But I love that it says so much more, and it relates to almost everything that I do with my money. So, for example, back to the other slide where the prayer is, So let me learn to love you enough, O Lord, that I need no constant stream of bright and shiny things to case some itch or ache within my soul. Free my heart from craven clenching as if ownership of a thing could ever bring about the gain of anything eternal. Or teach me in this moment, O God, how to yield my small desires to your greater will. Give me wisdom for the making of sound decisions. There's another prayer that hangs in the hallway in the center of our home and has for 35 years since Linda and I first heard it in a radio program called The Chapel of the Air. And it is true for us that the more stability that we have financially, the closer we get to retirement, the more we look at the numbers and say, you know what, I think we're going to be okay, the more we need this prayer that we learned back when we were driving cars with the felt hanging down from the ceiling. Because the more you have, the more you need a prayer like this. As I lead in prayer, in your heart, would you make it your prayer? Please pray with me. Your Majesty, thank you for what you have entrusted to me to manage on your behalf. These possessions, these resources, these gifts are not mine, but yours. Give me the wisdom I need to make them available for the work of your kingdom. I am honored to be your subject. Amen. Friends, today, and especially today, I welcome you to the table of the Lord. Don't we know that we need 
what is offered and given to us freely here by the Lord Jesus Christ, the same one who set impossibly high standards, said, I will love you right where you are. And it is that love that keeps changing us. So this is a family meal, and whether you're in person or joining us online, we're going to eat and drink together symbolically as we gather together and remember that we are family and we are his family. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And in words that must have shocked his disciples as he broke it, he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, remember me. Let us pray. Lord, you have given us so much, and you freely give, and you allow us to freely love you back by giving to you. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and cup. May they once again be for us the sign and seal of the covenant that binds us to you now and forever. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. And now, as you, our Savior, taught us to pray, let us say these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you're here in the sanctuary, we invite you to come forward through the center aisle and then make your way around toward the outside aisle where there are elements on the table. One person can certainly uh, take elements for the entire family. Please do respect that distance between you and the next person as you come. And then if you'll go back through the narthex and enter through the center aisle and return to your row. Also, for those of you at home, if you haven't done so yet, there's a good time for you to gather together whatever the closest thing is you have in your home to bread and wine in order that you might be ready to share communion together. We'll ask all of you, whether here or at home, to hold your elements so that we can all break bread together. I also encourage you to take these moments and just say, Lord, what is it that you want to say to me? What do I need to confess What do I need to ask you for? Where do I need wisdom? Where do I need grace? Talk to him about all the Holy Spirit has said to you today through his word. Please come for all things are ready.
are moments at which I just love remembering Jesus and that he did everything necessary to declare me good in the absolute sense. Would you join me, please, as we eat this bread, the body of Christ? The greatest cost was paid by the greatest person who ever lived. The Son of God in human flesh gave his blood that we might be forgiven. Drink and remember him. Eternal God, we give you heartfelt thanks for the display of your goodness we have experienced today. You have fed us with the spiritual food of the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, and have assured us that we are members of his invisible body and heirs of eternal life. Now help us as we leave this place to continue in that spirit of fellowship and do those good works which will please you. Through Jesus Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, we give all glory and honor, world without end. Amen. So we close with another great hymn that was from a 19th century Anglican female writer. And she wrote this hymn to reflect on all of the ways in which You know, we need to express these ideas to Jesus. She loved people, and she had spent a five-day retreat with 10 people, some of whom didn't know Jesus, others who were only sort of moderately interested and committed to Jesus. And she said by the end of the the five days, all 10 had received a special blessing and were connected to the Lord in a fresh way. That night, she wrote this hymn that is the expression of heart that I think God asks from each of us. Lord, I don't even know what it all means, and I'm a long way from getting there, but I tell you again, take all of me. I'm all yours. Let's stand as we sing together.
as always, if you'd like to know more about following Jesus or more about our church family, there will be contact information on the screen following the service for you to get in touch with us. And I just remind you to do it perfectly is impossible. Jesus did the impossible on your behalf. To even take the next step when it comes to good stewardship is very, very hard. But as you do, he promises, I will go with you and help you. And that knowledge, go in peace. Amen.